So let's see if this works. Yes, thank you very much uh, for, for coming. Um, who here knows anything about Open Wallet Foundation? I know at least four people do because I see a... Okay, maybe who, who doesn't know anything about Open Wallet? Okay, so sorry uh, for those of you who know Open Wallet a little bit, I'm going to bore you with, uh, by covering some of the basics. Um, and then I'm really excited to tell you more about the partnership with the United Nations and why we think that might be an interesting, an interesting idea. Um, let's start maybe with digital wallets. Most of you are probably using digital wallets. If you're using Apple Pay or Google Pay or Samsung Pay, you're using a wallet. And that's actually a good thing because if I'm a restaurant and you give me a credit card number, you know, you give me your physical credit card and I'm malicious, I can take that credit card and I can write down the number and I can write down your name and your CVV and, uh, you know, I can try to replay that basically and use that number in the future. When you use a wallet, it doesn't work like that. When you use a wallet, I get a one-time token and even if I'm malicious, if I try to use that one-time number again, it's not going to work. You probably use a wallet also when you board a plane, right? You store your boarding pass in those wallets. But wallets will do so much more. They're going to hold your driver's license. They are going to hold eventually your identity card, your passport, a university degree, maybe proof that you work for the Linux Foundation, that you work for, for a future way. A lot of this information is going to be in wallets and a lot of it will really matter. Things, for instance, like healthcare information, the fact that you are vaccinated, the fact that you are healthy, the fact that um, you, know, you have access to enter a room, most of those things will be in digital wallets. And we believe that there is actually a danger that something that you and I are taking for granted will slip away. So. When you're flying to Beijing or you're flying to San Francisco, you take your passport and you don't think twice, right? There is no incompatibility. You can use your passport and you can show it at the border regardless where you are. And the same is true with your driver's license. I can show my driver's license to any policeman in the world and I can rent a car wherever I want to do that. Transitioning this to the digital space will create new security challenges, but it will also create a big challenge to say, how can we remain interoperable? How can we be in a situation where you can use that passport or that driver's license anywhere you go? So how do we do that? Well, we started Open Wallet uh, about one and a half years ago, a little more than that. And the idea was to say, a lot of organizations are creating standards and then you have the actual wallets. We don't want to be a standard development organization and we're not going to create our own wallet, but we will help bring developers together to create open source components on top of the open standards underneath the actual wallets. And there's a really good role model for that. Uh, who here is using either Google Chrome or Microsoft Edge or Opera or the Samsung internet browser? I would say it's probably most of you. And who is using Safari? Yeah, so that's basically 100%. Now, all of you, everyone who raised their hand, you're using open source software. Not just, you know, a code project here or a little project over there, but really the core of that browser is open source. Uh, there is a project called Blink, which is part of the Chromium project and the Microsoft browser the Samsung browser, the Opera browser, obviously Google Chrome itself, they're all based on Chrome and Blink. And of course, Safari is based on WebKit. Now, WebKit and Chrome are not standards and they're not wallets, but they're basically something that is sometimes called a browser engine or a browser, um, a browser stack, a rendering engine, but 
whatever you call it, a lot of the code that goes in a modern browser is open source software done between uh, competitors. And so the simple idea was we're going to do the exact same thing for wallets. We will bring different people together who care about wallets and we are going to entice them to work together on a stack. And one and a half years later, we have about 60 members, uh, large companies like uh, Futureway, like Visa, like Accenture, like Google or Gen Digital are members. Uh, we also have uh, 26 universities that are participating. We have a lot of standard development organizations that are participating. And we tried something new. We are the first Linux Foundation project that created the Governmental Advisory Council. And the idea for the Governmental Advisory Council was really simple. A lot of companies care about wallets, right? Wallets are important for Visa or MasterCard or Google. But wallets are also important for governments. I'm not sure if you had a chance to listen to Paolo uh, this morning uh, from the European Commission. The Commission deeply cares about wallets. And if you come from the United States, the Department of Homeland Security cares about wallets. And the government of India cares about wallets with their DigiLocker project. And there is a project called Real DID in China. So governments care about identity and governments care about health credentials. And so the idea was from the get-go, if we want to create an open source engine that is really useful around the world, we need to convince companies to join this, but we also need to convince governments to join it. And I remember when we started thinking about this, a lot of people said this is never going to work. You know, governments are not going to join uh, an open source project. And then the first government that actually did join was the Kingdom of Bhutan. And people still said, well, you know, it's the Kingdom of Bhutan, so which is actually really unfair because Bhutan is a superpower in decentralized identity. But um, the second kingdom that joined was a slightly bigger kingdom. It was the UK, the United Kingdom. And now we have Argentina, Brazil, Mexico, Sweden, Switzerland, Portugal, uh, China, the United States, Papua New Guinea, all joined Open Wallet. And that's something that I find really interesting because I believe that in the wallet space, it's crucial to have countries and companies work together but there may be more areas where governments and the private sector share an interest. So I see it personally as a role model potentially for other projects as well. But with all these success stories, we also saw the limitations. We've seen, for instance, that the government in Japan said that they find it difficult to join a private organization not the Linux Foundation specifically, any private organization, right? If you're a government, you're not really used to be a member of a private club. And so about uh, eight months ago, nine months ago, we started thinking, well, what would be a better model that doesn't feel alien to governments? And when you think about it, if you are a company and you want to work together with another company and you want neutral governance, what do you do? Well, you go to the Linux Foundation or the Eclipse Foundation or the Apache Software Foundation and you know, they have the core competency of helping companies work together. Well, if countries work together, where do you go? Imagine you are a country, you want to work together with another country, where would you do that? Well, we thought maybe the United Nations. You know, the, United, the UN is a little bit like the Linux Foundation of countries. You know, this is where, as countries, we go to work together. And so I broached the subject, and Wen Jing is here. He's one of uh, my bosses. He's on the board of the Open Wallet Foundation. And I basically floated this idea, and the board of Open Wallet was very supportive. Some people at the Linux Foundation said, ah, you know, you're going to waste five years of your life and then in the end, the UN is going to say they don't care. Um, but we said, you know, let's, let's try. And um, within three months from the first conversation, we had a memorandum of understanding with the United Nations 
which has two key components. The first one is that the United Nations will host the Governmental Coordination Committee, so they will basically host the Secretariat for countries to speak with each other. And the Secretary General of the ITU this week will send out 193 letters, 179 basically inviting countries to join the new Open Wallet Forum, and 14 thanking countries and saying, it's great that you're part of uh, the Government Advisory Council of Open Wallet, please transition over to the United Nations. And the second component is that UNICC, the United Nations International Computing Center, will host a mirror of open wallet code. Why? Because we believe it is absolutely crucial that any country in the world can access this code. And no individual country should have jurisdiction over that code. You know, if this is becoming the, the code foundation for wallets around the world, you don't want any one country to be able to make a decision on behalf of other countries. You basically want this under neutral jurisdiction. And the United Nations can offer neutral jurisdiction. So we're really excited about both. The UN hosting uh, the Governmental Coordination Committee, as well as the UN hosting a copy of the code. The only countries that would be blocked are countries under UN sanctions which I think makes a lot of sense. You know, you want a body that is able to block a country, but not one country being able to block another country. It should really be a collective decision. So we announced this about three months ago at the World Symposium on the Information Society, the biggest UN tech conference. And this is a sneak peek. On October the 1st, we will formally launch the Open Wallet Forum. Uh, three countries, Japan, South Korea, and Switzerland are also financially supporting this, which is great that it's not just private money uh, for the public sector, but it's actually countries spending public money on a public initiative. And we're also fortunate that the, the Gates Foundation is supporting this through uh, co-develop. So we're going to announce this, uh, sorry, we're going to launch this on October the 1st. And the goal is to do two things, provide the best place in the world for governments to meet other government officials and be able to have conversations from one official to another of saying, hey, this is how we do things in Europe with the EUDI wallet. What are you doing at the Department of Homeland Security? Or what are you doing in India? Uh, as well as providing a forum where governments and the public sector is able to meet with the private sector and where basically companies and uh, countries can speak with each other. You know, when you think about it, one of the key reasons, Stephen Wally told me this earlier today, and he said, what is the, the raison d'etre? What is the, the real reason that organizations like the Linux Foundation or the Eclipse Foundation exist? And he said, the real reason is to drive competition out of the room, to say, yes, maybe you and I are competitors, but we have a shared interest, and in this room, we're going to work together. And I think the Open Source Foundations, by and large, do a pretty good job in doing that. You know, we are driving competition in certain limited spaces out of the room, and that's really useful. But there is also competition in some cases between the public sector and the private sector. There is a large tech company um, that spoke with a large European government and I had the pleasure to be in the room and it was basically that tech company telling the government, you don't need to do anything. You don't understand. You know, we are the professionals. We know best. Just relax, sit back, enjoy the ride. Let us take care of the wallet infrastructure for your country. And we tell you what the standards are. We tell you exactly what you need to do. Do as we tell you and everything is going to be fine. And they were genuinely surprised to hear that government saying, actually, we can't do that. That's the future of identity in our country. We cannot just outsource that to a private tech company. But you also see a response sometimes on the other end of the spectrum, which I think is equally dangerous and hurtful 
where you have governments saying the private sector is the enemy. We're doing these digital public infrastructure projects in order to protect us against the uh, private sector. And we had a really interesting uh, keynote panel at Money 2020 earlier this year with uh, Pramod Varma, who is the chief technology officer, uh, was the chief technology officer of Athar and UPI in India. And we discussed what the P in digital public infrastructure stands for. You probably have seen this on Paolo's slide uh, on, the, on the EU presentation. You know, wallets are critical digital public infrastructure. What does it mean, digital public infrastructure? Some people will say the P in public infrastructure means that it's software that comes from the public sector, that it's software that comes from the government. And I really disagree with that. I think the P in digital public infrastructure means that it benefits the public, that it benefits you and you and you and all of us in this room and in this city and in this world. That's what public means. It does not mean that an NGO or a company cannot be part of digital public infrastructure. It's something we can create together, but we need to create it together, not just as companies or as private sector organizations. I think we need to create it together uh, between the public sector and the private sector. So in a nutshell, this is what we're trying uh, to do. It's an experiment. Uh, I think uh, it's the first partnership between the United Nations on the one side and the Linux Foundation on the other side. And there is still plenty that can go wrong and plenty we have to learn. Uh, it starts with simple names that uh, you know, we have one name on our side and the United Nations has a different name for the same thing. Um, but I think by and large, there is a huge opportunity to bring companies and countries together and tackle some of the biggest challenges we're all facing uh, in making things work. You know, not to single out video codecs, but maybe if you work on a video codec, maybe some countries really don't care about that video codec. But when it comes to wallets, governments do care and a lot of companies do care. Um, we discussed that we want to make this interactive because this should not be like a YouTube video. Um, I hope you might have questions or recommendations or ideas where this could go, or maybe uh, stories about uh, you know, areas where you yourself had hoped governments would sit at the table, or if you are from a government, where you'd hope the private sector would be on the table. I, I really love the question. And I think one interesting word is the word sovereignty. Because there is all this, you know, there are all these ideas that obviously you want to be sovereign. As a country, you want to be sovereign and, uh, you know. Oh, sorry. Yes, of course, my, my apologies. So uh, the, actually, let, let's see if this works. Does this work? Can we make it work? Yeah. Hello, hello. Um, what I, the question was, or the statement was, that my issue with current implementations is, is that they rely on the citizen owning a smartphone that is controlled either by Google or Apple. And if this is a, is a strict requirement, then this destroys all the sovereignty that you want to create by having an open source implementation for a wallet. And we somehow need to get around this, in my opinion. Yeah. Maybe you keep it and maybe someone you know, wants to, to take it afterwards. So, I think it's a very, very good question. My personal view is that digital sovereignty is probably a pipe dream. Not a bad idea, not something that is not worth having, but ultimately to be truly sovereign would mean that, you know, if you're here in Austria, right? So if you looked at it from an Austrian perspective, 
we would have to have our own chip factories. We would have to have our own factories producing smartphones. We would have to have our own operating system that we control. We would have to have, um, you know, the entire ecosystem basically that allows this to happen. And I think unless there are two ways to tackle this. One way is essentially to look backwards. So, you know, some countries have a very low smartphone penetration and we're working with organizations like MOSIP, for instance, on the question of, you know, how can you put this verifiable information in a QR code on a piece of paper? And you can be a lot, it's a lot easier to reach sovereignty on a piece of paper with a QR code, right? Because, yeah, you know, we, we actually do produce paper here in Austria and we can print a QR code on it. But you also lose, of course, a lot. Like doing a zero knowledge proof on a piece of paper in a QR code, not sure how to do that. So I think one way of being absolutely sovereign would be to simply go backwards and say, this is what we do. You know, if a solution requires cooperation with others, we're not going to do it because we really want to control every bit of the value chain. My hope, and it's only a hope, and you know, it's not a guarantee, which I think would be naive, but my hope is that we can define a safe space where we say, yes, we're going to enable Android and iOS and uh, you know, maybe other operating systems in the future like Harmony in China. And yes, that creates dependencies, but let's sit together and discuss under which circumstances these dependencies are okay. So for instance, my personal view is that a wallet should not be a business model. My personal view is that a wallet should not sell your data. It should not try to sell either personal data or transaction data. It should be a vessel, you know, a neutral vessel. Maybe if we can agree on such principles, it's okay to be dependent. I don't know, you know, if there's any better way um, because I've been in some meetings where people think not inviting Apple or Google or Samsung to the party will somehow magically make you independent. But I do think that's not the full picture because, you know, at the end of the day, you're still part of someone else's operating system and you're still part of someone else's hardware. So unless we nationalize, uh, every country is trying to nationalize one smartphone manufacturer, I think we do need to find ways to work with them, but not just to ignore the topic of sovereignty and to be blind to it and to say, you know, it's not a challenge. I think it's a huge challenge, but I think having these companies at the table will make the solution better, not worse, if we can agree on rules, how we want to play. Is this a satisfactory answer? Do you have a better idea of, you know, how you would do it if you would have, if it's just your decision? I didn't mean to exclude Google and Apple. I mean, that's the, that's the reality that most people do have those phones and make the, make the wallets usable on those devices is definitely desirable. I don't disagree. I just think that it must not be a hard requirement that you cannot use a wallet if you're not using a phone controlled by either of those companies. And that's the reality currently. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, having fallbacks is important on two levels. The first one is that, um, you know, if you don't want to use any of those platforms uh, in a very wealthy country, you should have that option. And that's going to be true for the EODI wallet. You know, you will continue to have your passport. You'll continue to have um, an ID card. No one is going to force you to use the EODI wallet. Um, but there is also another really important element here, which is in a lot of countries, people will not be able to afford smartphones. And I've been part of a conversation where we talked about global credential compatibility. And there were a lot of very, very smart people, way smarter than me in the room, uh, talking about, you know, this zero knowledge proof versus that zero knowledge proof and the pros and the cons to different credential formats. And then one person said, well, what if you only have a feature phone? And what if a family of eight shares one feature phone, not a smartphone, just a dumb feature phone? And what if a family of eight doesn't even have a feature phone, 
what then? Are we creating a new digital divide? You know, are we creating something that is going to create a new problem where we make it harder and harder and harder for some people to participate in digital ecosystems? So I think that's the, the second part of your argument of saying, you know, we should not create a situation where we in wealthy countries become dependent on a few companies, but we should also not create a divide where people based on where they were born are unable to participate. Yeah, but the solution is, in my opinion, the same because you just yeah. need a little bit more flexibility. You must not have a system that says, okay, you, you need to have a smartphone, but you need to have a system where you say, okay, the private key could be with a cloud provider, the private key could be on your phone, the private key could be on a security token, the private key could be on the TPM in, in, in your operating system. Yes. And you need to have an interface for various operating systems to leverage those keys. Then we would have sovereignty and then we would have a choice by the people and then you would also be able to tackle various use cases of people having more or less money for resources. I, I would agree with almost everything you said. So I think it's definitely desirable to have these fallbacks. I think total sovereignty is probably still going to be very difficult because I agree, of the... Yeah. Yeah, hmm? but it's, it's not a black or white it's question. It's not like absolutely 100%. So I think it's just, you know, for many people, I think the discussion is almost like black and white. Like, you know, let's just follow these three instructions and you gain total digital sovereignty. I think if you have an operating system that is truly malicious, that's, that's going to create problems almost whatever solution you use. But uh, yeah, I agree 100% with you. And that's why at Open Wallet, we are not favoring one solution. You know, we're not saying you have to use this credential format or you have to use um, a, an edge model or you have to use a cloud model. You can do anything. And if you have a great idea or, or you, you know, mostly, for instance, started to contribute software that is uh, by definition more on the server side, because in the countries that MoSIP operates in, uh, there is just no infrastructure. So it's not, not even just a question of, you know, can I depend on the goodwill of that company? But is there even enough, are there even enough smartphones in the population? Any other question about the United Nations? Please. Do you want to just raise your, your voice or should we bring you? See, this is what is so great about open source conferences is everyone is working together and we're sharing mics and code. Um, <laughs> Getting some exercise. Yeah, so uh, two questions. Um, one is about the United Nations. Could you maybe expand a bit on um, what it means, for example, if uh, a private organization wants to contribute to uh, the Open Wallet Foundation and uh, what the process is how would it in the end be propagated to the UN? How does code arrive there? Uh, and the second one is about uh, biometrics. So the only way to get like um, high level of assurance credentials into a wallet requires biometric verification in many instances. And one of the issues that we're running into is that if you implement a third party biometrics provider for say a government and you want to make sure that they don't experience vendor lock-in, um, you really quickly run into these uh, proprietary templates and that kind of stuff. Does the Open Wallet Foundation also aim to solve that piece of the puzzle? Yeah, two Really good question. So the first one I think is easier to uh, to respond to. So anyone can contribute code to Open Wallet. Uh, we have a technical advisory council, like most other Linux Foundation projects. Um, I think, Wenjing, you're on the tech. Have we ever said no to any project? Uh, not, uh, not so far. Not so far. And we have, I think, 15 projects, and we will probably be at 25 at the end of the year. So. Um, you know, we really want the Open Wallet Foundation to be a big tent uh, for as many projects as possible. And while we will never force developers to work with each other, the idea is that when developers are part of a bigger organization, 
Um, you know, we are promoting these projects to each other. We're trying to introduce the developers to each other. Uh, I jokingly referred to Open Wallet once as a Tinder for developer. You know, the, the, the idea basically is to have a place where you meet. And if you find something interesting, and if you find a way to work with someone, you can do that. And if you don't, you don't. You know, it's still your choice. So if you contribute code to Open Wallet, you know, there were a couple of people mentioned this, or called this donate code. And I'm really against this idea of donating code because if you donate your kidney to me, I would really appreciate if you would not come back 10 years and say, you know, I'd really want to have my kidney back. But that's the beautiful thing with code, of course, right? You don't donate it per se. You're, I think of it more as you park it at Open Wallet. And if Open Wallet is a good home, a good space for your code, that's awesome. And you're still the developer, you're still the maintainer, right? We just encourage others to work with you. And if a day later or a year later, you say that's actually not a good home, well then, you know, you do something else. So uh, I think we re are really interested to attract as many developers as possible to contribute code anywhere, you know, whatever programming language, whatever um, uh, formats and standards you are, you are uh, embracing, and then trying to see if we can bring developers together to start not just working next to each other, but to explore working with each other. So maybe, you know, we don't need six SDJot implementations. Uh, but if we do need six, six SDJot implementations, because this is what the community wants, then that's what's going to happen. So second question, I think actually harkens a little back to your question, uh, because the, the fact that uh, you probably want to use the biometrics in a smartphone, for instance, is also part of the dependency you have and why I think it is at least difficult to achieve, you know, perfect sovereignty. Um, what's interesting is you said, I don't exactly recall how you said it, but, you know, does the Open Wallet Foundation want to support this or fix this or address this? And the way I think about it is that the Open Wallet Foundation doesn't do or want anything. The Open Wallet Foundation is here essentially to keep the lights on, take the trash out, keep the toilets clean. This is your show. You know, Wen Jing and I here are there to serve you. We want, we believe that it's important to have this space for developers, which is why we invest time and money and resources and a lot of efforts in this, but this is not about us. Uh, this is really very much about what developers want, what companies want, what governments want, and they have a place where they meet and where they find consensus or don't find consensus. You know, we have projects, code projects, that come from people who feel very differently on what a good credential format is. And uh, Open Wallet will hopefully never say this is a good format and this is a bad format. And there was a concrete example I can give you. Are you familiar with the QVAC controversy that happened uh, some months ago on the IDAS 2? So it was, I don't want to go into the specifics, but it was basically a big, uh, forgive me, a big, big shit storm around one aspect in the IDAS 2 regulation around so-called QVAC certificates. And the Linux Foundation signed an open letter taking a side in this, uh, in this debate. And I understand very well why they did it. And, you know, a lot of companies, big companies, small companies, Google, Microsoft, Mozilla, I think they were all part of that. And um, I remember that they sent this to me and they said, can you please sign on behalf of Open Wallet? And it was more like a formality, you know, like, like of course, Open Wallet is going to sign. And I said, Open Wallet cannot sign this letter. Because we have, at the time, we had, I think, only 10 governments, but we had 10 governments. I don't know what these 10 governments want. And I don't know what the 60 Open Wallet members want. And what I want as ED is completely irrelevant. It is really completely irrelevant. And I will not say publicly what I want, because I think that is not just irrelevant, but it's really harmful, because people could construct my personal views as views of the foundation. So. I think, you know, there is value 
in having a country that has a very clear position and maybe even military might to defend it, but there is also value in having a place like Austria or having a place like Switzerland that is trying to be neutral. And I think there is a good reason to have an organization where the organization itself is neutral. And it doesn't mean that you have to be neutral if you contribute code or if you contribute opinions. Of course, you should have your own opinions and developers will always have opinions. What is the right programming language? What is the right, uh, uh, the right standard to transmit? You know, is it open ID for verifiable credentials or DITCOM? And if it is DITCOM, which of the 100 something DIT methods are we using? I see people here who know a lot more about this than I do. But you, know, you will always have these opinions. And I think it's absolutely fascinating to listen to these conversations. But the Open Wallet Foundation is not here to tell anyone that they're right or wrong. Because even if we tried to do that, we would utterly fail, right? I'm not sure if anyone here is part, has been part of the IDAS2 expert uh, group. I have not been, but I've been to a couple of the IDAS2 expert um, uh, group calls. The European Commission, like the European member states, don't agree with each other exactly on the finer details of the IDAS2. There are different ideas within the Department of Homeland Security in the United States as to what a good credential format looks like. It would be really, really difficult to try and come up and say, here's the credential format. Can you please all agree on using that? Um, th there is a, a metaphor I have in my head. Um, when you're in Geneva, I can highly recommend a train that goes from Lake Geneva to the Alps, to the Swiss Alps. And it's a really scenic, beautiful train ride. And for almost a hundred years, people got on the train in Geneva and then halfway they got off the train, switched to another train and then finished the journey. Anyone have an idea why? Why would you get off a train and then go on another train? It's not the view, although that would be a really good reason. No, it's the gauge. So the train tracks in Geneva are, and I'm not a train expert, so forgive me if I'm saying something rubbish, but basically like normal train tracks. And then in the Alps, they become narrow gauge. And so, you know, you basically took one train and then at the end of those tracks, you get off and then you get into a narrow gauge train and then you finish the journey. The way I'm trying to think about the wallets we need is there is a new train. It's only a few years old and it's really fascinating if you are in Geneva and if you like views and mountains, I highly recommend it. It's called, I think, the Golden Pass train. You get on the train and the train automatically adjusts to the new train tracks and, you know, it doesn't even stop does that and actually I see a couple of friends from China here you have the same train system in China I read so it's not just a Swiss uh, idea but it's really incredible you're on this train and you hardly realize that anything changes now that is about real rails rails made of steel but we also have metaphorical rails we have payment rails and we have identity rails and those rails are as different or probably even more different than the rails made out of steel. And so our wallets need to behave a little bit like that train, I think, where when you cross from one country to another country, when you cross from one use case to another use case, it's not one credential format to rule all credential formats, but we basically have wallets that adapt to these different realities. And when you think about it, um, you know, I know a lot of people who love browsing, like when I just think about my kids, for instance, they love browsing the internet and they love looking at a lot of videos and, and images. And they probably have no idea that there is a difference between TIFF and PNG and uh, JPEG. And, and really, you don't need to understand the difference, right? Because your browser is abstracting all of that complexity away. You can basically install that browser and then look at not every, but almost any image and your browser is going to render it. So the hope is that Open Wallet can help create something that is a little more like that. And in this browser analogy, when you think about it, Marcus, where would you say, where are we in terms of browsers? I would say we are at, in the age of CompuServe. You know, like, like not even uh, the first 
um, Mosaic browsers because Mosaic was already something global, right? There was already HTML and HTTP and we are in a world in many areas and I wonder if you disagree, if you do, please say something where, you know, it's basically me, I'm creating my project and then there is my little, you know, fiefdom where this works and then you create your project and then you, you, we all start more or less from scratch and we do our little things and there is not one global wallet project that is trying to, you know, really work anywhere uh, with globally accepted standards. So uh, I think the glass half empty view is there is really a lot to do and we're really, really early. The glass half full view is wherever you are in this ecosystem, there is so much to be done and there is so much to be created. And I think there is really a huge opportunity uh, in this space because at least to me, it really feels like the very early days of the web. I see you nodding. I would have, I, I was afraid you'd say, no, 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 we're actually at Netscape 6.7. Please. And, and can I say thank you so much for the mic service? You're, uh, you're an amazing audience. Thank you. Uh, two specific examples, I mean real life examples. So, a friend of mine changes his name, uh, but soon after, his ulcer breaks, he ends up in the hospital with no health insurance because healthcare services know nothing about him, you know, because he changed his name. Only ID was updated and so on. Uh, I spent, while he was in the hospital, I spent a week of my life chasing papers, you know, with ministry of this, ministry of that, just to, you know, prevent him for mounting, you know, expenses, hospital expenses. So this is one specific problem that open wallet, of course, I mean, generally digital wallet is trying to, you know, I would be very thankful if we had something like that, like that uh, back then. On the other hand, look, we are relying, smartphones are, are super, super useful, but we are relying more and more and maybe too much on smartphones, what would what would happen if I say, you know, now I'm going to the air, airport from this conference and drop accidentally my phone in the taxi, for instance, or train? You know, I wouldn't be able to board a, to board. I wouldn't be able to pay for another ticket because I can't access my bank account with my smartphone and so on. Now, this is uh, another danger that we are uh, maybe failing to address with all those, you know, wallets and whatever is on the smartphone. We are too much relying on smartphones and increasingly so. So the former head of uh, Android security uh, actually left his post to become a professor at a, I think he was a professor before, but to become again a professor at, a, at an Austrian university. His name is René Meyerhofer. And if he would sit here, I think he would be uh, fully agreeing with you. And he's trying to create a privacy preserving way of your face and your uh, you know, fingerprint to act as a wallet. And it's a fascinating uh, problem because obviously you know, it's difficult unless you want to embed a verifiable credential under your skin. The question is how to do that in a privacy preserving fashion. But I think that's probably the holy grail that you don't need any device. You don't need any tool whatsoever. It's enough for you to be you, but to do it in a really privacy preserving way, not to have a database with uh, uh, 10 billion, uh, no, 20 billion retinas, two retinas per person. Um, uh, that's probably not the right way to do it. So, you know, as far as open wallet is concerned, we look at even the term wallet really very holistically. It doesn't have to mean that it's an application on a smartphone. I think that's one instantiation of where we are in terms of the evolution. But, uh, you know, in 20 years, hopefully it's going to look very, very different. And I completely agree with you. Ideally, you sh it should be enough for you to be you and not to carry anything. Um, 
I think we are over time. I don't know if that's the case, but I think this was a 40 minute uh, session. So thank you so much for your time and thank you for your, for your questions.